all of you participating with us here today can ask questions through the question and answers function during the event and upvoted by participants. And we are, of course, happy if you take the chance to feed in your questions to us. And also, of course, if you're not a speaker, always mute yourself during the webinar. And we are really proud to launch this first indicator report of the laws of countdown in Europe, together with European experts representing different key organizations. And it's a new transdisciplinary research collaborate, collaboration that monitors progress in health and climate change in Europe, published in the last of public health. And the latest evidence on how climate change is undermining the foundations of good health in Europe will be discussed, as well as the health benefits of a rapid and robust response to climate change in Europe. And I'm really happy to first invite Mrs. Elena Wischner-Malinkowska to give some opening remarks. And Mrs. Wischner-Malinkowska is head of the Climate Adaptation and Resilience Unit in DG Climate Action of the European Commission, and also leading on the new strategy for climate adaptation and the Horizon Europe mission on adaptation. And you were also responsible for the European Climate Pact as a new major citizen engagement on climate action. Please, Mrs. Lena. Thank you very much, Maria. And first of all, thank you for these kind introductions and for the invitation. Um, about a year ago, I think, I had the pleasure of contributing to the launch uh, event of the Lancet Countdown in Europe. And today, fast forward one year, we celebrate the publication of its first indicator-based report on climate and health. So really wholehearted congratulations for this achievement. And throughout this year, we have uh, come to appreciate the Lancet Countdown uh, in Europe as a trusted and co-partner of our European Climate and Health Observatory Initiative. We've all heard that saying, what gets measured gets done. It means regular measurement and reporting puts problems on the table, keeps us focused, informs our decisions and help us improve the results. And in this sense, the evidence provided by initiative like the Lancet Countdown in Europe has been essential to make us uh, more aware and to address the health dimension of climate crisis. The European Green Deal ambition of making the European Union climate neutral by 2050 will help to prevent the worst global warming scenarios, hopefully. Also, the switch to clean uh, energy sources uh, that we try to accelerate as much as we can and to a decarbonized economy should deliver significant direct and near term health benefits. And let me stress in this context, also the huge benefits for the climate, the environment and our health, which a switch to more plant based foods would deliver something which we still do not consider enough. Still. And this year's summer of disasters was a painful reminder. We also must work to prevent and adapt to climate impact that can no longer be avoided. And there are great uh, opportunities for effective action to reduce human suffering due to climate and weather disasters and to lay foundation for keeping us healthy and well in changing climate. We see a growing momentum in the health profession engagement with climate change and in the climate community's awareness uh, of health dimension of global warming. What is more, the climate uh, health uh, connection has risen rapidly to take a much more prominent position in health and climate adaptation policies at all levels compared to just two years ago. First, at the national, international level, the World Health Organization is continuing its intensive work on climate and health. The communique which uh, the G7 health ministers published this May emphasizes the need to tackle the climate health nexus alongside global pandemics and antimicrobial um, resistance. At the European level, we keep developing and investing in the European Climate and Health Observatory, which our colleague Alexandra Kazmierczak will present in more detail later on. A new cluster of EU-funded research projects on climate change and health kicked off this September. 
in at the European Health Forum uh, in Gastein in Austria. We are poised to uh, include a focus on health in our work program for 2023 of our Horizon Europe mission on adaptation to climate change. We have used our EU health uh, policy platform to catalyze the creation of a thematic network on climate action through public health education and training. And finally, we have started to develop together with the European Environment Agency, the first European wide forward-looking risk assessment, which will also include a chapter on health. Expected to be published in early 2024, it should inform the work of the next European Commission and also the next multi-annual financial framework of the EU. So let me conclude. The gravity of the climate crisis demands bold and transformational change across all sector systems and parts of the society. It is a teamwork, as I used to say always. Uh, we all must work together you, at European, national, regional, local authorities, uh, researchers, businesses, uh, representatives of civil societies, everyone and in the same direction. And the work of the Lancet countdown in Europe and today plays very important role in this John's effort. So I have no doubt uh, that today's new report will support our work on better climate resilience. And I do really work, uh, look forward to continued cooperation with all of you on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alina, for this. And um, it's really encouraging to hear the visions and the work that will be performed. And uh, now I would like to introduce uh, um, Dr. Dago Bergetson, Egetson, an Icelandic uh, politician and the mayor of Reykjavik. And uh, you are a trained physician with uh, also with degrees in human rights and law. And we really look forward to hear your um, visions also for the sustainability of European cities. Very feel very welcome. Thank you so much, and and greeting from the city hall of Reykjavik. Uh, yes, it's right. Uh, I was. Uh, I'm, I have a medical background and was actually uh, heading for specialization within infectious diseases, exploring the interconnection uh, of human rights and pandemics uh, some 20 years ago when I was hijacked into politics. Uh, I'm still here in politics, uh, but it was, uh, to say the least, interesting uh, to experience the last two years. Uh, I, I couldn't have uh, a better suited background to uh, address uh, the pandemic in, in kind of a context of a city. Uh, and uh, this is the second time I'm honored of, of being with the Lancet and the Lancet Countdown, uh, focusing on climate and cities. And uh, I very much celebrate that. Uh, both, I think that uh, health is maybe a, a focus that we could uh, use more in the discussion of climate change. And also, I think that in every policy, uh, we not only need health, but also uh, evidence-based approach uh, for the decisions we are taking. Uh, my inspiration uh, as a mayor comes from uh, medical doctors, physicians working in city context 100 years ago, when it was very natural uh, to think about the determinants of health as uh, a big part of uh, kind of doctor's <clears throat> professional lives, uh, be it social economic factors, air pollution, uh, insufficient housing, or the living conditions of people in cities that kind of uh, meant a lot, uh, clean water, uh, and and so on and so forth and uh, and I really think that 
uh, cities should be a center of the discussion on health and climate change. Firstly, because uh, the future lives in cities, kind of uh, literally speaking, people are flocking to cities all around the world. And this century will be a century where we are going from um, around 45% of people living in cities to maybe up to 80, 90% at the end of the century. Uh, so in cities, we will face the biggest challenges of our century. Uh, and uh, in city context, uh, it will be decided if we will tackle climate change or fail. And we can't afford to fail. Uh, other kind of big challenges of health actually uh, are very uh, near and city context uh, inequalities being the strongest single determinant of health is something that uh, is magnified or diminished uh, in in cities things like affordable housing as well and uh, air pollution obesity so uh, when it comes to uh, the climate, uh, the, the biggest challenges is in, in many cities, uh, retrofitting houses, uh, green mobility, addressing inequalities, as I mentioned. But what we hear in the news is uh, a lot about uh, flooding, uh, which is a, a huge uh, challenge when it comes to adaptation and, and wildfires. But actually, uh, a lot of research is coming out now from cities that the single most kind of killer connected to climate change in cities is probably heat. Uh, and uh, big cities like San Francisco and Athens uh, are, are now uh, creating uh, positions called heat officers to address this because hundreds and thousands of people are dying uh, connected to heat waves. And this is kind of a phenomena that maybe have, haven't had uh, the attention it should have. Uh, I want to underline though that heat is probably not the biggest challenge in Reykjavik uh, to be sure, uh, but it, is a part of what we have, have to address uh, when it comes to cities and, and climate change. Uh, when I spoke uh, at count, uh, Lancet Countdown last time, uh, we were discussing how to plan a way out of COVID. And uh, then the task was to uh, get people uh, into work again, investing heavily. And we, <coughs> we <coughs> sorry, in Reykjavik were, as many cities, directing that investment into green infrastructure and green investment. Now the picture has changed. We have inflation. We are uh, trying to deal with an energy crisis. Uh, but I think that although the, the context have changed, interest rates have gone up that are making investment harder. I think that we have to see this as a climate challenge as well. When it comes to people housing and isolating it, uh, both from heat and cold, uh, when it comes to trans, uh, uh, forming the energy systems into green energy or transforming mobility into green mobility. Uh, the, the biggest challenges go health uh, hand in hand. They are challenges of the climate and the uh, fight against climate change, but man, many of the remedies there are exactly uh, the same things uh, that uh, needs to be done when it comes to health. Uh, in, the, in the history of Reykjavik, uh, we saw that we took the big leap into 
uh, hooking every household into central heating and green energy in the 70s in light of the uh, oil crisis. And I uh, hope and want to stress that I think that is exactly what the world and the uh, cities of the world needs to do now, is to uh, see this energy crisis and uh, the crisis of cost of living as uh, a challenge uh, where we need a leap forward into a greener future um, and at the same time tackles the, the big issues of today. Uh, Reykjavik, although we have geothermal energy, we were also a city of smog and coal uh, smog in the 20th century and we got rid of that and uh, probably have one of the cleanest air uh, in Europe and uh, and the world today but um, because of uh, traffic and because of small uh, particular matters that come from traffic we nevertheless have uh, kind of peak days and we know from uh, European research that uh, having dealt quite efficiently with COVID, we can expect that we had more deaths from this city of that has uh, almost the cleanest air in the world last year from uh, smog or small particular matters than from COVID. And, uh, and that kind of underlines how the environment in the cities affect our health. Uh, the solution is uh, greener mobility, and uh, that is also addressing uh, uh, higher uh, weight in uh, in the population of uh, a lot of cities. Underlying this are social determinants of health, like inequalities. So it's all kind of a, a mixture. That, that goes to the, the heart that health is uh, at the heart of the problems we have to solve in cities. And actually health speaks uh, very much to the heart of the people living in the world and living in cities. So I think that health should be uh, a stronger focus in all of the climate discussion uh, not only in cities, but uh, not least in cities, because there uh, we will uh, fight the good fight and uh, find the solutions we desperately need for the climate and for the health of our population. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dago, for this valuable city perspective. Um, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Marina uh, Romanello and Marina you're the executive global director of Lancet Countdown and we are really uh, really happy to have you here. Can thank you, please... you Maria and yeah. thank you so much everyone for joining. And you will give an overview of the global Lancet Countdown on oh. health and climate change. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to share my screen and I hope I'm successful and if not I know Kim has the presentation. Is that showing? Perfect, it looks like it. Thank you so much for having me here. We're really excited to see the first European report of the Lancet Countdown coming out. This is an enormous milestone and it has been a huge amount of work for the whole team, but we're already seeing how much information is provided and just how important this piece of work is. I'm gonna tell you a bit about what the Lancet Countdown is, what the global strategy is, and why we think that this, these regional reports are so fundamental to driving climate change action that protects health and well-being of people all around the world. The Lancet Countdown story actually starts in 2009. In 2009, we published the first ever Lancet Commission of all Lancet Commissions, and that commission was on climate change and health. Richard Horton was determined to understand what are the health implications of climate change and what we could do about it to protect people around the world. But the findings were quite daunting. The conclusion of this first commission in 2009 was that climate change is the biggest health threat of the 21st century, something that the WHO simultaneously concluded. And it was pretty groundbreaking at the time. 
and the health community in response starting putting an enormous amount of effort in researching what these links between climate change and health look like and what we could do about tackling this threat. So just about six years later, the second Lancet Commission on Climate Change and Health was published. And the evidence that we had gathered up until then gave a slightly different conclusion. And it was that climate change is not only the biggest uh, global health threat of the century, but most importantly, as we heard already Dagger saying, tackling climate change could be the biggest global health opportunity of the century, because we know that the action we need to take to tackle the climate crisis can all shape into very sensible public health interventions. And one of the conclusions of this second commission was that we needed to be monitoring our activities and understand where we're at and what we're doing to protect people's health and producing evidence that can guide policymakers to deliver the best outcome for the health of their people. And that is how the Lancet Countdown was born. The Lancet Countdown is a global initiative and we've been since producing a series of indicators each year. We just published yesterday alongside the European report, the Global Lancet Counter Report, that is the seventh iteration of over 40 indicators monitoring the health impacts of climate change and about everything monitoring the health opportunities of accelerated climate action. And these reports are global. They help us take stock of climate change and health, which is a global threat. And they help us know what's happening at a global level with decision makers. But as we heard from Dagger, climate action is local and the effects are being felt locally by people in cities, by people in different countries. So that's why climate change and health requires evidence that is relevant at a local scale that feeds from local data sources. And that is why for the last three years at the Lancet Countdown, we have been focusing our attention in opening a series of regional centers around the world in key locations that can assess how local vulnerabilities are emerging or changing, that can assess the impacts of climate change, and above everything that can help us assess what are the opportunities of local climate action to the people that suffer these impacts. Obviously, the Lancet Countdown in Europe is one of these centers, and it's a crucial one because Europe, we know, is the biggest, uh, one of the biggest historical emitters of greenhouse gases but it's also moving forward very rapidly in the decarbonization. So we're enormously proud to see this product coming out um, today. Taking into account all of these regional centers, the Lancet Countdown now brings together about 100 different institutions and almost 300 authors, academics, and researchers from around the world. And you will recognize on screen some of the world's leading academic institutions and many UN agencies that come together to produce these annual iterations of global indicators and local indicator reports. Yesterday, we published, as I said, alongside the global report, the Lancet Countdown in Europe's first report. We've also published the fifth uh, report of the MJA Lancet Countdown in Australia. We're gonna publish the third China report over the weekend. And the first South American report will come out soon, a bit later in the year. All of these products help us get a better sense of what climate change means for different people and how its effects are being felt disproportionately in different communities. But most importantly, we really hope that the evidence that these reports are producing can help inform local policymakers in taking decisions that can, can protect the health of people from the emerging health threats and deliver a better future for all. So just to share very briefly the findings of our global report that are very well echoed with the European report, we're seeing that there's a global persistent addiction to fossil fuels. And that addiction is not only exacerbating the health impacts of climate change, but are also worsening the impacts of the concurrent crisis we face, particularly the cost of living crisis, the energy crisis that Europe is feeling so deeply right now. We're seeing with great concern that companies and, government and governments are continuing to prioritize fossil fuels to the detriment of people's health. We keep on investing subsidies in fossil fuels. We keep on taking strategies that would undermine a healthy living for people all around the world, including here in Europe. However, we're seeing that countries now are trying to devise responses to a very big energy crisis, cost of living crisis. And in doing so, they can produce responses that align very well with climate change and with a healthy future. We could today deliver a future with cleaner air, with healthier diets, with more active lifestyles, more livable cities, 
improved, strengthened health systems, and ultimately a thriving future for all. So I'm just going to close with some words that um, the UN Secretary General, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, shared with us in response to these reports. The climate crisis is killing us. Human health, livelihood, household budgets, and national economies are being pummeled as the fossil fuel addiction spirals out of control. But the science is clear. Massive common sense investments in renewable energy and climate resilience will secure a healthier, safer life for people in every country. And with that, I will just thank very much all of the authors of the Europe report of the Lancet Countdown for the amazing work they've done. We're really proud to see this coming out and this milestone for Europe. And especially very many thanks to Kim and to Rachel who have worked tirelessly to get this out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina, for also putting the European report into the global Lancet Countdown context. And now we will listen to Professor Rachel Lowe, Director of the Lancet Countdown in Europe. And Rachel is an ICREA Research Professor and Global Health Resilience Team Leader at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And she's also a Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And Rachel, you will give an introduction to the Lancet Countdown in Europe. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. And it's been a, a real pleasure to hear from our keynote speakers. And thank you very much, Marina, for setting the scene for this talk. We're absolutely delighted to be presenting today our first indicator report um, towards a climate resilient future. So Kim Van Dalen will be presenting um, the indicator findings from this report. But first of all, I would just like to um, explain to you a little bit about our Lancet Countdown in Europe initiative. So as Marina mentioned, this collaboration was established because Europe is one of the uh, that one of the historically uh, areas most responsible for uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also is a very important financer of actions to, to try and mitigate this. And we have a responsibility in Europe to protect well-being and health, both for the European society and for people across the planet. So we are delighted to have joined the Lancet Countdown family alongside the other regional centres. And um, we are also working with those other centres to try and uh, find synergies, particularly with our partners in um, South America and in small island developing states to see how we can build on the knowledge between our different regions to produce policy relevant indicators in these different climate change hotspots. So we follow um, the approach as set out by the Lancet Countdown to track uh, the impacts of climate change on health across five different domains. We look at tracking um, impacts from climate change by using approach where we monitor hazards, exposures and vulnerability to climate change. We are also tracking uh, progress of uh, governments to implement adaptation measures to protect societies and mitigation efforts that have been um, implemented to try and reduce um, the greenhouse gas emissions. And at the same time, tracking the co-benefits that can be achieved from having cleaner air and a more um, livable city where things like physical transport um, are feasible. We're also monitoring the economic and political context of this shift towards a uh, carbon neutral society. So this is our core team. I am incredibly grateful to this team who have made this collaboration possible. Um, Maria um, is our chair and we're joined by Josette Marie Anton, our co-chair from IS Global. Uh, Kim Van Dalen has done the most incredible job um, coordinating this entire collaboration. And we are so grateful to you, Kim, for everything you've done over the last year. Um, I'm also incredibly grateful to our working group leads who we will be hearing from in the panel discussion to understand the science behind the indicators. We're also supported by um, the WHO European office and of course by um, Marina Romanello, the executive director of the Lancet Countdown collaboration. 
So this uh, work would not have been possible without our 44 incredible authors who have contributed their expert knowledge and indicators. Um, and we're very grateful. Our collaboration is uh, growing and we're very uh, looking forward to be welcoming new indicator authors to, to the project. So these 44 authors are based across 29 institutions in Europe. <clears throat> We have um, a website where you can learn more about our, our team, which is included in the Lancet Countdown uh, platform, where you can also access the reports and the um, explore the data in more detail. And if you're not doing so already, please make sure you follow us on Twitter. Um, this is where we share all the latest information about our reports, uh, events, and highlighting um, the work from all the authors and partners in our collaboration. So last year we published our first framework publication laying out our vision for this project and then this year we're delighted that on Tuesday evening our, our very first indicator report was published. This is a, um, a tremendous effort to put together 33 indicators from all our collaborators tracking progress. And what we're hoping is that these indicators will be uh, very uh, informative and useful for um, policymakers. In particular, in particular, we are collaborating with the European Climate and Health Observatory that Elena mentioned. This is a collaboration between the EU, the EEA, and other partners contributing to the um, EU for Health and the European Green Deal. And within this uh, platform, uh, the, this provides information to support um, adaptation towards climate change in terms of country profiles, case studies and indicators. And in particular, this year, uh, 10 of our indicators will be included in the European Climate and Health Observatory. Um, these are just two examples of uh, green space and climate sensitive infectious diseases. And through this platform, users will be able to interact with the data access the data relevant to their country and this will be launched alongside um, an EEA policy report on the 9th of November. So that our collaboration has been contributing to these policy reports. Um, we will hear more about this from Alexandra from the EEA uh, later on. This year we contributed to a report that particularly focused on the impacts of heat and infectious diseases. We provided indicators related to heat related mortality and infectious diseases, including West Nile virus, uh, dengue and malaria suitability. So as Elena mentioned, we're, we're delighted that the Horizon Europe programme has funded uh, this new climate and health cluster. So this particular action focuses on the health impacts of climate change and costs and benefits of action and inaction. Uh, so uh, this cluster comprises six projects that are looking to develop indicators, early warning systems, and other de uh, decision support mechanisms to improve adaptation and mitigation measures for health um, in Europe and beyond. And uh, these projects are focusing on several different areas, including infectious diseases using a One Health framework and monitoring um, the impacts of non-communicable diseases, uh, ocean health, uh, vulnerability of healthcare workers, um, women and um, labour, for example. And across this cluster, uh, we're looking to uh, synergize data management, policy strategy, and our communication dissemination to make sure that as a, um, as a collaboration, we can be more um, powerful and have more impact. So there are two of these projects which are supporting the Lancet Countdown, both by producing robust evidence-based indicators to feed into our, our report and also providing partial support to keep the Lancet Countdown in Europe Centre um, operational. So um, one of those projects is ID Alert. This is led by Professor Joachim Roklov at Umia University. And the other project is Catalyze, which is led by Dr. Catherine Tonney at IS Global. So our ID Alert project, um, this is a European collaboration where we are looking to innovate the way we are able to resist um, emerging infectious disease outbreaks in Europe by combining the IPCC framing of risk in terms of hazard exposure and vulnerability with the One Health approach to monitoring animal, human and environmental health. So we're working to develop uh, Europe-wide uh, policy tools 
and also focusing in on particular hotspots across Europe, in Spain, in Greece, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, and also in Bangladesh, to devise uh, effective tools combining both climate information with citizen science and novel data streams to build the best decision support systems that we can. This is uh, an outline of how our project is organized. We have a series of packages that will be developing both indicators to feed into the Lancet countdown in Europe and also to produce uh, projections into the future given different scenarios. And we will also be developing a seasonal indicator platform to provide early warnings from two weeks to several months in advance of the changing suitability for outbreaks or emergence of zoonotic infectious diseases. We are also working in our hotspots to integrate novel data streams and um, developing um, integrated stakeholder and policy engagement mechanisms. And finally, um, the Catalyze project is designed to produce uh, robust information to develop indicators and early warning systems and has three main questions which are related to how to optimize health in climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation, how to close knowledge to action gaps to accelerate climate change action, and how should health systems adapt to climate change to reduce our carbon footprint. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for being here. And I am very much looking forward to the rest of the event. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel, for this uh, introduction to the Great Work in Lanza Canton. And um, now I would like to introduce to you um, uh, Kim van Dalen. I would like to welcome you to give a presentation on an overview of the key results in the Lancet Countdown Europe report. And Kim, you are a Gates Scholar and PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge in UK. So please, Kim. Yes, thank you so much. I am just going to try to share my screen with you. Um, if I can figure that out. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Rachel for the introduction in the Lancet Countdown in Europe. In this presentation, we will further explore some of the selected key findings from our indicators. But before we start, I would like to thank again our 44 incredible authors who are key in generating all the different indicators that you can see in our report. And of course, the 29 different institutions that are a part of this affiliation. So as the world, world's first largest economy and a major contributor to cumulative greenhouse gas emissions, Europe is a key stakeholder in the world's response to climate change and has a global responsibility to create more equitable and healthy economies that are based on zero carbon energy. To ensure that health and well-being are protected in this response, it is essential that we build capacity to understand, monitor and quantify the health impacts of climate change and the health co-benefits of accelerated action. Therefore, in our first indicator report, we will report on 33 different indicators that monitor and quantify the health impacts of climate change and health co-benefits of accelerated action since the 1950s. Without accelerated mitigation and adaptation, ongoing climate change will have irreversible multidimensional impacts on human health, resulting from exposure to extreme climatic events, heat-related morbidity and mortality, and altered environmental suitability to infectious disease. As Rachel indicated, we have a similar structure to the Global Lancet Countdown, in which we present our indication indicators um, using five different working groups or five dif different sections. And our first section is focusing specifically on climate change impacts, exposure and vulnerabilities, in which we have all these different indicators in the reports. For the purpose of time, uh, we will just highlight a few of these indicators, but I highly recommend uh, to look to the whole report for the results that we present for all the different indicators. So if one of the indicators um, in our report is focusing on physical activity and heat stress risk. We know that regular physical activity provides major physical and mental health benefits. However, when people exercise under extreme heat, it can present acute risk of heat stress and eventually heat stroke. 
In this indicator, we report the number of hours in which heat exposure poses a risk to health during physical exercise, unless action is taken to reduce the risk. When we look at the figure here, we see the hours of risk per person per year for physical activity related heat stress per European region. As seen in the figure, we see that heat stress risk during physical activity has increased across Europe since 1990, and this is particularly the case in Southern Europe, where risky hours per person reached about 429 hours for medium activity and 627 hours for intense activity. One of our other indicators is focusing on drought. With increasing temperatures and altering rainfall patterns, the risk of drought is increasing in Europe. This indicator tracks the frequency of extreme to exceptional seasonal drought in Europe with the standard precipitation evaporation index. In this figure on the left, we see the total numbers of extreme drought events over the extended summer period in Europe between 1951 and 2020. Whereas in this figure on the right, we see the total number of extreme drought events, uh, we see the percentage of extreme drought events that occurred in a year 2011 to 2020 compared to 1951 to 2020. Overall, we have seen that 55% of the NOTS2 regions face extreme to exceptional summer drought events between 2011 to 2020, in which one year in, in which one third of the NOTS region has experienced more than 40% of the events recorded in the past seven decades. We also see that accelerated human mobility and increasing climate suitability for arboviral disease, disease transmission is increasing the emergence of arboviral diseases in Europe. In this indicator, um, we use the model to estimate the basic reproduction rate and length of transmission season for dengue, combining information on temperature, rainfall, mosquito abundance, and human population density. Overall, what we see is that in the period 1986 to 2020, the R0 has increased by 70 0.3% in, in Europe compared to 1951 to 1985. In a sub-indicator that's also included in this indicator, we monitor the estimated rate of imported dengue cases to European regions into locations in Europe where conditions are suitable, and we see that presented with a black line here. We see here that between 1990 and 2019, the number of estimated imported cases per NOTS3 region increased by 600% within areas of Europe that show climate suitability for dengue transmission. Another thing um, which is unique to the Europe collaboration is that we track um, allergenic pollen. What we know is that a change in climate is associated with shifts in flowering seasons of most plants, which leads to changes in seasonal pollen allergies. This indicator monitors the temperature-induced changes of the start of clinically relevant pollen seasons for three types of trees, berk, alder, and olive, in which we can see the results for berk here on the left and the results for olive on the right. Increasing temperatures during 1981 to 2020 have been associated with flowering seasons for the increase of tree species starting about 10 to 20 days earlier. So overall, looking at the COVID-19 pandemic and the increasing climate change driven risk that we outlined in the previous section, this really emphasizes the need to protect populations from increasing health shocks. And therefore, in the second section of the report, we explore health adaptation planning and assessment and adaptation delivery and implementation. So in these sections, we have uh, these different indicators that focus both on uh, planning and assessment as well as delivery and implementation. And I will highlight two of the indicators indicators in more detail. So firstly, to adequately prepare and respond to climate, change, climate health hazards, health systems should have access to climate information. Based on 2021 World Health Organization Health and Climate Change Countries Survey, only 10 of 22 countries in the World Health Organization European region have climate-informed health surveillance system. Of those, um, for heat-related illnesses, um, are only 10. We have eight that report um, systems for injury and mortality related to extreme climate events, and we have uh, six countries that reported systems in place for vector-borne diseases, and four has systems in place for waterborne diseases. One of the indicators, indicators of this section focuses on green space, and this indicator includes two different components. The first one tracks exposure to green space measured by the population-weighted NVDI at the country level. Population-weighted greenness seemed to increase during 20 
to, during 2000 to 2020 in most European countries, with a larger percentage increase taking place in Southern Europe and the smallest increase happening in Western Europe. The second part of our indicator monitors urban tree coverage. Here we see that the mean urban tree coverage in European cities was 28.5% when including cities with their commuting zone. When we look at the city level, Savona, a city in Italy, has the highest proportion of urban tree coverage, whereas the city of London in the UK has the lowest. Then looking at our, the first section of our report, we know that greenhouse gas emissions from the EU account for about 17% of global cumulative greenhouse gas emissions, making Europe one of the major contributors to the climate crisis, placing the lives and health of hundreds of millions of people at risk globally. And therefore, in this section, we track the European efforts to mitigate climate change and their associated health code benefits from the reduction of ambient air pollution and a transition to more sustainable and healthy forms of travel and diet. In the first indicator, we use data from the International Energy Agency and show the carbon intensity of the energy system in Europe. Here we see that carbon intensity has decreased by about 8% in the past 15 years, with an annual weight of change of about 0.5% per year. However, to reach net zero emissions by 2050, the European energy system should decarbonize at least five times the current pace. And that's what we can see when we look at this graph as well. In this graph here, we see the carbon intensity of total energy play in Europe from 1990 to 2020. And the red line shows the rate of the reduction that is required to meet net zero by 2050. However, the black line shows the extrapolation of the current trends, which shows that we need to um, have a much, much faster decarbonization than that we currently have. We also look at the coal phase out, and we know that coal has the highest carbon intensity of all fuels and is responsible for about 16% of particulate matter concentrations in Europe, which is an important contributor to premature mortality. Here we see that since 1990, coal use has decreased in Europe around 56%. However, coal use is still contributing to contributing to about 12% of the total European energy supply in 2020, and rates of reductions are incompatible with net zero targets. Then when we look at exposure to refined particulate matter air pollution, or PM2.5, this is a leading environmental risk factor for premature mortality, and this indicator tracks in premature mortality that is attributable to air pollution from the combustion of coal, liquid fuels, and gas fuels from different economic sectors. We have seen that stringent air pollution emission controls have resulted in reduced air pollution-related mortality in Europe since 2005. Yet, despite improvements in air pollution, the indicator estimated that at least 94% of European populations are still live, living at air pollution concentrations that are higher than the New World Health Organization guidelines. Furthermore, the indicator also shows that air pollution-related deaths from com the combustion of fossil fuels have decreased by 60% between 2005 and 2020, but still account for almost 120,000 deaths annually. Mitigation in the agriculture sector also has big decarbonization potential and can lead to improved health outcomes by having more healthy and more plant-based diets. In this indicator, we merge data from the Food and Agriculture Organization with life cycle emissions estimates to report on greenhouse gas emissions associated with food consumption. Here on the left, we see the greenhouse gas emissions from fruit demand as a proportion of the total territorial emissions. And on the right, we see the food-related CO2 emissions per person by European region and food group. The results show that in 2019, food demand from Europe was responsible for about 1.85 gigatons CO2, CO2 equivalents, corresponding to about 31% of all European greenhouse gas emissions. So when we then look at the economic impacts, we see that both drivers of climate change and climate change related health impacts have profound effects of European and global economies. Accelerating the commitment to climate change mitigation will likely prevent detrimental economic impacts. And this adds further health co benefits by safeguarding socioeconomic determinants of health. In this section, we explore two broad domains. The first set of indicators estimate the healthcare costs of morbidity and mortality that may already be occurring in European populations because of climate change. And in the second domain, we monitor the, econo the economics of the transition to zero carbon economies. 
So one of the indicators um, is focusing on economic losses to climate-related extreme events. Because climate-related extreme events can damage physical infrastructure in the mine public service provision and result in both direct and indirect economic losses, which may have additional health implications. Over the past decade, we have seen that highest economic losses due to climate-related extreme events were observed in 2021, as can be seen in the graph that is presented here, with an absolute economic loss totaling about 47,000 million euros. The vast majority of these economic losses in 2021 were experienced by Germany, which was about 30,000 million euros, which is related to the German floods that happened in 2021. Introducing adequate carbon pricing mechanisms can internalize the negative externalities of fossil fuels. What we mean with that is that the price of carbon reflects the cost of emitting the pollution. And including health impacts, in this can therefore include health impacts into prices for goods and services that generate these externalities. In this indicator, we subtract the fossil fuel subsidies from carbon price revenues to estimate economy-wide averages average net carbon revenues and prices in Europe. When we look at these, we see that only 15% of countries had net positive prices, which are discouraging fossil fuel use. However, 28 of the countries had net negative carbon prices, which means that they are effectively subsidizing fossil fuels. Of these 28 countries, 15 countries provided net subsidies to fossil fuels that exceed 1 billion euros a year, and the median value of subsidies was around 1.2 billion euros. So in the previous sections, we have shown the urgent need to strengthen the response to health impacts of climate change in Europe, which require a supportive political context in which key actors and institutions across society acknowledge and engage with health dimensions of climate change. In this section, we therefore track the engagements and coverage of health and climate change in wider political and government structures in Europe. One of the indicators we show that there has been an increase in scientific engagement Sorry, quick interruption because my laptop is um, low in battery. Okay, I'm back. Um, so in this indicator, we show that there has been an increase in scientific engagement with climate change and health since the early 2000s, with a large increase in the past five years. That can be seen here in the top panel. In 2021, we saw that 366 articles on health and on the health impacts of climate change were published in Europe. And increase of about 9% in 20, from 2020. Most studied countries in 2021 were Italy, Spain, and Germany, as can be seen in the figure down here. One of the other indicators um, in this section is focusing on individual engagement with health and climate change on social media. So overall, little is known about how European population engage with health and climate change. However, social media in Europe, particularly Twitter, exposes online engagement with the topic of health and climate change. In this indicator, we track the total number of tweets per month in 2021 by European users who refer to climate change and health. And this can be seen um, here in this figure. You see that there was a spike in engagement towards the end of 2021, which may be linked to the COP26 COP summit and the publication of the Lancet Countdown Global Report. So overall, the Lancet Countdown in Europe highlights the accelerating trends in health-related hazards, exposures and vulnerabilities and risk from climate change. We also highlight the insufficiently ambitious adaptation and mitigation strategies, which can be seen in this overview view figure here. Without urgent acceleration in mitigation and adaptation efforts, the health impacts of climate change are likely to worsen in the coming years, affecting the well-being and lives of millions of people, not only in Europe, but more importantly beyond. The implementation of ambitions, mitigation and adaptation strategies will not only protect lives and human beings in Europe, but also in countries that have historically contributed least to anthropogenic climate change. This report highlights the urgent need and opportunities for accelerated action in line with climate targets to support a healthy climate resilient future for all people. Thank you so much for listening. Um, you can find more information um, on the collaboration in our website. And I, of course, also highly recommend to have a look at the full report. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kim, for this overview of some selected key results. And now the time has come for our panel discussion on climate change and health in Europe. 
And uh, the panel is chaired by Maike Voss, Managing Director for Evidence-Based Policymaking at the German Alliance on Climate Change and Health, Klug, and also for the Center for Planetary Health Policy, CPHP. And over to you, Maike. Thank you so much, Maria, for your kind introduction. And thank you all for, for presenting these very, very relevant results so far. We will have 30 minutes now to discuss climate change and health in Europe towards a climate resilient future with some of the um, authors um, of the report we just um, heard the results of. You will also have the short opportunity to send and rate questions via the Q&A function box um, for the panelists. So get ready for and send your questions if you would like. And we will do um, three quick rounds of prepared questions um, with uh, some of the um, authors. Um, and then we open up for questions of um, the audience. And I would like to start with you, Joachim, um, on exposure, health impacts, and vulnerabilities to climate change. Um, you are the Alexander from Humboldt professor at the Heidelberg Institute of Global Health and um, the Interdisciplinary Center for Scientific Computing at Heidelberg um, in Germany. And the, questions, uh, the question I have for you is, what are the big challenges in tracking the health impacts of climate change in Europe, um, which are right now happening? There is a, thank you. There is a few challenges. I think one of them is to be comprehensive, um, and that uh, pertains to actually having data and data that we can actually upscale to the European level um, on the most important um, health impacts. And um, currently, that's not the case. Um, the, I think the indicators presented in the report are rather comprehensive, but um, there could still be very important pathways and impacts that's not being covered because it's currently not possible um, because of data and also partly because of uh, some of the impacts are going to be um, complex and it's difficult to actually ascertain and attribute um, the relationship to, to the climate forcing. So that's uh, both an analytical and, and data task. Um, there is also things um, which I think uh, is really important to consider uh, thinking about the trends uh, in, in terms of uh, impacts in, um, and exposures and vulnerabilities. Um, and that's that we, uh, in the report, cover extreme events, for example, which could have systemic um, consequences on health systems, on society, um, which uh, manifests in, in different ways and in complex patterns. Um, we do not really um, ascertain the direct health impacts from these events here um, because it's uh, it's just, you know, a com complex and, and it could lead to many different uh, impacts. So that's another sort of challenge. How can we actually improve our description um, and, and monitoring of, of impacts and exposures uh, to be more uh, specific in, in terms of exactly how it affects health. Uh, a last uh, challenge, I think, is also um, considering multiple drivers of uh, climate, and but also vulnerability in socioeconomic changes and also regional uh, modifying factors. In this report, we do consider um, the, the sort of, you know, um, um, multitude of um, moderating factors and uh, alongside with climate. And, and I think that's an important improvement, but I also th I think we could go further into understanding and describing how climate change will interact with other layers of uh, vulnerability, for example, socioeconomic inequalities, et cetera. And uh, I hope we can do that in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you also give a sneak peek of what's ahead and maybe in the next report and what you're looking at. Thank you so much. Um, let us dive um, deeper into the working packages of adaptation and mitigation with um, two of the authors. Professor Jan Zemenska is currently associated also in the Heidelberg Institute for Global Health at the University of Heidelberg in Germany and also with Dr. Catherine Thonney. Um, she is an associate professor at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health 
um, where she works there. And I have also a question for you too. Um, what are the needs for transformative change to adapt to and mitigate climate change to protect public health in Europe? So maybe Jan, you could start. Sure, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question, right? I mean, what do we need to do? And I mean, it's, it's clear that we need a proactive, timely and e effective um, strategies to cope with climate change because there's no other way to get around that to reduce uh, the potential uh, impacts. And Kim in illustrated some of the indicators that we have in the report. And Doug Uwer mentioned the fact that uh, uh, San Francisco and, and Athens have these health officers that are now put in place to protect the health from the public. Because if you think about the heat wave in 1995 in Chicago, in the United States, and the heat wave in 2003 in Europe that had devastating impacts on public health at the time, ever since then, we have implemented these heat health action plans in the United States, in Europe, in other places that have had a dramatic impact on, on population health by reducing heat-related mortality and morbidity for, from these kind of, of climate events. And um, I think that, that's where it's at. We need to come up with these early warning systems trying to monitor climatic indicators and see what can we do to, to reduce those type of, of um, risks. But there is no doubt that the metrics in this field are challenging. How do we measure the impact of an inter intervention like that and show that we have a, a positive uh, impact on, on public health? Um, so we do need to think outside the, back, the box in order to deliver more robust health systems in order to overcome the negative impacts of, of, of uh, climate change on, on disease risks. Um, and I think we need to engage in both the health community, but also the community in these early warning systems, because unless the community is engaged, there will not be an impact, right? We need to make sure that people are on board, both in the measurement of the impact, but then also in, in the response and, and trying to move people out of harm's way from, from these climate hazards. Thank you so much. Catherine, also over to you. What is needed for transformative action? Uh, thanks very much, Micah. Um, I mean, in terms of mitigation, uh, it, I think it's it's clear we should focus on three areas of change where we we know from the scientific evidence that uh, could deliver very large health co-benefits. And these health co-benefits would be delivered in the relative near term and at a local scale, benefiting the population where the action is taking place. And that really focuses on uh, areas we've heard other speakers, uh, particularly Elena and Dagor mentioned earlier, but transition to clean renewable sources of energy, which will deliver large health co-benefits through uh, reductions in air pollution exposure, shifts to healthy plant-based diets, which will deliver large health co-benefits through uh, the dietary risk factors associated with consumption of, uh, of animal foods, particularly red meat and uh, dairy. Um, thirdly, to transform our urban transport systems in public space to make walking, cycling, and public transportation really the dominant ways that we get around our, our urban areas. And this really has the opportunity to deliver uh, uh, health co-benefits through increased physical activity, also contributing to lower uh, air pollution, but we the physical activity uh, exposure pathway is really important there and uh, not something that would be achieved if we simply uh, shift our current uh, combustion engine-based uh, motor vehicles for electric vehicles. Um, I think in, in these uh, mitigation actions, it's really essential to understand the equity implications of what these changes mean, uh, to put in place policies and plans to ensure a just transition. Uh, we, 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 we need that for many reasons, but also it's a really important aspect of building uh, broad public support for the kinds of transformations that, that need to happen. Um, I also think there's a, a, a real imperative to communicate the message of the health co-benefits. If you look at the indicator report, there are a lot of very um, sobering, uh, alarming uh, you know, trends that come out of it. 
But the co-benefit story is really a story of opportunity. It's a very positive story. And I think, uh, you know, what it's a potential way to really engage people who might not be otherwise engaged in uh, in um, climate change and, and the uh, climate change action. So I think this aspect of, of it being an opportunity in particular that the benefits can be achieved in the relatively near term, uh, you know, makes it a really important strategic focus for, uh, for um, change. Thank you so much, Catherine. We will move on to the last two um, working groups, Economic of Finance and Tracking Politics and Governance on Health and Climate, with Professor Anil Makhandia, um, Distinguished um, Iker Basque, I hope I, I got this right, <laughs> Professor at the Basque Center for Climate Change in the Basque Country in Spain, and Dr. Nihir Dasandi, um, who is an Associate Professor in Politics and Development in the School of Government, University of Birmingham. Um, Anil, let's start with you. Um, how can we realize this transformative action Jan and Catherine has just laid out? What are the economic, finance, and political levers to get us there as fast as possible? Well, there are many, uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm yes. not really in a very convenient place. Um, yes, well, there are many things that have been raised uh, in the discussion so far. That, that can be done and actions that have been uh, uh, identified by previous speakers. Uh, of course, uh, what uh, perhaps one of the things we need to, to be aware of is that there are two channels through which uh, we need to monitor the effects of, um, of, of, of climate change on health on the economy. One is that it actually affects the growth of the economy and the uh, level of well-being of people in, in economic terms. And uh, we need to have the, 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 the levels that we need to have in place to address that include uh, allocations of budgets uh, for, for addressing these, but not only to the health ministries, but also to ministries that can cater for and provide uh, supporting adaptation measures. Um, you know, at the moment, in, in many European countries, uh, the health services are under under extreme pressure. And uh, as we begin to look at the additional pressures created by climate change, we need to find ways in which we can we can address that. Uh, by and part of it, I'm afraid, will need more more resources. And, and the other is to see that where climate change is having an effect on on our growth, uh, on our e e economic development and sustainable growth in, 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 the, in, in the coming decades, we need to really think of innovative ways in which we can get around this. So we ha have to think of developing the economy so that it is less dependent on the kinds of activities which create uh, health hazards uh, Catherine mentioned the obvious co-benefits that arise with the addressing climate change there, but there are also other areas of change in, in, in activity in travel, for example, or, so moving to sustainable travel, sustainable mobility, which will help us to, to move the economy in a way which is both healthy and, uh, and in which the, the, the climate health linkages are decoupled. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nihia, also the question for you, what is what is needed and how do we realize this transformative change? Absolutely. So, I mean, one of the things I'd, I'd want to point out from the report is um, the general indication is um, while there are, while there is progress, it's obviously not not fast enough and, and not um, strong enough in a lot of ways. And uh, I'd say a lot of uh, the actions taking place are, are taking place in quite a top-down manner in that there's a lot of engagement with policymakers around specific areas. Um, and one of the things that comes out of the report from the indicators that are looking at the, the, the political domain is that public engagement is actually um, incredibly low at the moment in, in Europe around issues of climate change and health. So one of the indicators that, that Kim mentioned was uh, the social media indicator. And, um, you know, of all of the tweets that that, that were um, tweeted about about climate change, uh, less than one percent of them uh, mention health in in Europe. 
Um, and a lot of those um, we we do know are, are linked actually to to the Lancet countdown and, and come at the end of the year when when these reports come out. So uh, I think you know the the progress that has been made, which which is limited, um, it's being done with a really shallow political base. We're we're seeing very little mobilisation of the public around the issue of climate change and health. Um, and we know and, and we believe, as as I'm sure everyone at, at this um, event believes that you know engaging people on the health um, impacts the health co-benefits, um, as, as Catherine mentioned, of, of climate change, um, does have the potential to, to, to mobilize the public to, to get that engagement going around the issue of, of climate change. And there is emerging evidence that suggests that's the case. So um, I think one of the big things is we're doing uh, everything that's taking place at the moment. It's, it's being done on a really shallow base. And we know um, from other policy domains in Europe, uh, that where we see public engagement, where we see greater public pressure, we are more likely to see those sorts of shifts occur. So um, often at these events, we talk about the lack of political will, but one of the big pillars of that political will is, is the public. Um, and so currently, uh, I'd say that that's the, the big area. And then the other area, which I think um, we also need to think a bit more about is just around, uh, as well as producing that evidence, how that evidence is being used, how how it's being engaged with and and uh, again, I think um, it's worth flagging that, you know, in the Catalyze project, that is part of what we're looking at is, is, is going to be around uh, how different groups engage with that evidence. But I think that's that's another big thing. It's it's these tools and this evidence. And it's obviously uh, incredibly important that we produce this and we produce this at a local level, as Marina said. But it's then how we're, we're ensuring that evidence is used, uh, not just by policymakers, but obviously ultimately by po policymakers, but also uh, by key stakeholders like the public, like the health community. And I think um, that's another area where where we could see more action. Thank you so much. Um, super interesting what you just said on um, the public engagement and public mobilization and how to reach social tipping points to really get the, the, the pace and the, the amount of action that we need. Thank you so much. Thank you to all uh, of you for the first round of questions. We have a little bit more time for questions from the audience. So I have a look in the, um, in the Q and A box. Please also keep sending questions to the audience um, if you would like to raise one. I'm looking at the question from Kurt Straff, um, which is on um, air pollution, I think. No, I, let, let me read the question um, um, quickly. Um, Kurt Straff asks, I think there is a strong scientific consensus that air pollution is the number one environmental factor for adverse health outcomes, largely caused by combustion of fossil fuels, which is one of the main causes of climate crisis. Thus, a, trick, a strict regulation of air pollution will be a win-win scenario. We talked about co-benefits for climate and health. Why is then the EU not following the latest WHO guidelines in reducing PM um, 2.5? Um, as we know, there is a new EU directive on air quality that was just um, published, I think, yesterday, the day before. And um, so I think the question is regarding to this. Who feels ready to come and answer this question? So, uh, yes, I would also yeah. say it's a great question. I think from the uh, I think the evidence is is absolutely clear that we need uh, to reduce air pollution levels, uh, the lower the better, the, the WHO guidelines really are the benchmark we should be heading for, uh, you know, what happened in terms of the political process that is, uh, you know, that led to the, um, that it, not so much the the limit values, but really the timeline for achieving those limit values, you know, where I think we really need much more ambition in Europe. Um, the other thing I would say is that, uh, you know, if you dig into the indicators that we have, um, you know, air air pollution has been going down in Europe. That's a that's a, a very positive story. But some of those um, achievements have been uh, accomplished through end of pipe control uh, technology, which has been you know effective at reducing air pollution, but not not delivering the mitigation, the climate change mitigation uh, benefits as well. So um, I think uh, we need increased ambition uh, to get the air pollution levels down, but also really focus on the actions that are going to deliver the win-wins. And, and uh, you know, we have other ways that are important for reducing air pollution, but we what we we need we need to get the win-wins that are also going to deliver the uh, you know the reductions of of um, 
of uh, CO2 uh, equivalents. And you know, we know what needs to be done. We know what are the, let's say, uh, big, uh, let's say, win-wins. It's really just about delivering the uh, increased ambition from a policy point of view to make them happen. Thank you so much. Yeah. So the level of ambition needs to be quite yeah. higher. Anil, would yeah. you like to come in as well? Well, just to say, yes, I do agree with Catherine, but just to note that uh, there is the issue of the, the transition, the issue of equity, and some of these measures that we need to take to really uh, to ramp up uh, the the, the uh, targets uh, for emissions reductions do have some equity effects. And particularly in these difficult times now with an energy crisis, we'll have to be careful that we don't uh, hurt the vulnerable and poor when we try and do that. And Thank you. It can be done. Yeah, thank you for highlighting the, the equity aspect uh, once again. Um, I have another question from Gudrun Weinmeier. Um, could the high social media activity in Greece be related to wildfires? So explaining the, the peaks, which highlights um, that this activity could be violated depending on local events. Yeah, Maybe absolutely. Um, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, what I'd say is surprising is it's that there's not more of a sense of even you know we we'd expect with with um the the wildfires in greece and the effects that they clearly had that we'd expect more engagement not just in greece but but in other countries that are obviously observing these things and so i think uh, that's absolutely right i think there's two uh drivers of of social media engagement i think one of them is exactly that local events um which we'd expect and then the other is sort of um as we mentioned it's sort of the bigger events like the the, the cop and and the launch of the, the the annual reports um so yeah i mean one of the questions is um how how we engage people in a way where when we see these events when we see you know wildfires uh, across europe that there isn't much more discussion around um what this means in terms of those links between climate change and health and 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 how you know we need to take action so yeah absolutely thank you so much i mean speaking as a national stakeholder in the ngo field it's rather how can the national actors accelerate and engage with the public to to mobilize there i think it's it's a european question but also a national question what kind of resources do we have and structures do we have in countries there um thanks next question okay of course joaquin please yeah i just wanted to make a, make a comment on that because i think that's one of the challenges overall with climate change it's, it's a lot of silent changes continue small um you know incremental changes every year and month and so on and um we don't doesn't really uh recognize how important these changes are until there is an event like you know mm -hmm. a wildfire or um a heat wave and uh we need actually to to be better in communicating the relationship i think between the silent slowly smaller changes to these big um bursts uh which has been um we, which we can predict to some extent although uh the exact occurrence is 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 harder to say yeah and get out of the vicious circle between neglect and panic neglect and panic and rather have a preventive mm. look at the at, at what we know from the data yeah yeah and of course and, and just to follow up on that you know we also tend to be the victims of our own success right it turns out that there are great fire early warning systems that monitor the emergence of, of high fire risk uh, in, in Europe. And then that helps us to intervene very quickly. So we do tend to be victims of the, pro the, the, the success that we have had in adaptation uh, specifically because we are able to prevent major outbreaks, major uh, wildfires, major impacts like that, because we tend to act early on the certain circumstances like the wildfires, you know, where we have these European-wide early warning systems. So we do tend to be the victims of our own success, and that doesn't help us in the long run. But I think that comes back to how to communicate these successes. And I think, I mean, looking to WHO and other big global health or health actors, that was not always the strength. So how to communicate where you have been or the health community was successful, I think, is also then a, a factor to mobilize again. So I think it's about communication in the end. 
Um, I see, Catherine, that you are typing a question, but I think the question is so uh, an answer. I think the question is so relevant that I would put it here um, as maybe the last one. Um, it is a question from Camilla Anderson, who firstly congratulates all of you for your great work. And then um, oh, now it's gone. Let me see. Oh, maybe it went into answered. I'm yeah. sorry, because I, I, I found it. I found it. You were speaking. <laughs> I found it all good. The question is regarding health co-benefits and public engagement again. Where, for instance, and in which consumption section do you see the biggest and more the biggest and then also the, the easiest leverage for health co-benefits? What should we prioritize here? Um, so just to summarize what my answer, I think what really comes out from our indicators is, is the large potential from uh, co-benefits in, in the agricultural system, in the food system. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about air pollution co-benefits. Uh, we have a lot of evidence on the air pollution co-benefits and uh, in terms of sh the potential for shifting diets to healthy plant-based diets, it's received considerably less attention. Um, and, and, and from, let's say, the research community, but also I think people are just less aware of it. Um, and I would, I, the one sort of key aspect of that is the potential to reduce methane, which uh, has a much shorter lifespan in the atmosphere compared to CO2. So the, the climate benefits of uh, reducing uh, animal, uh, basically meat and dairy is, uh, you know, would be realized in a much uh, shorter time frame. So um, there, it's not the only one, obviously, uh, you know, air pollution and, 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 these, and, and, and the um, urban transport interventions, very important, but I think what really comes out of this report is is the potential for uh shifting to uh low carbon healthy diets thank you yes thank you. anil you uh agree with that yeah, yeah yes i, I think it's a, as we sometimes say it, it is the low hanging fruit now it's the one that we <laughs> to pick up to pick something where action has less action has been taken and where more can be gained relatively easily in terms of cost but let's dive a little bit deeper what then why then don't we see more action in these specific fields um Catherine you just mentioned like what is the elephant in the room what is holding us back um I I think I think the research community will, you know, is moving in that direction. We will, we will get there and start doing more research to really get the, uh, you know, better numbers on the potential co-benefits. But I think in terms of realizing change, what is very interesting to me about uh, the um, healthy diets is that it's, it's a much more, you know, the lever of change is with individuals, you know, mobilizing individual behavior change, uh, which we know from public health, it's never easy, but, uh, you know, it, it's a really, I think, we have this different, we need different strategies to sort of get this uh, bottom up individual level change, whereas in energy system and infrastructure changes, it's, it's going to be much more top down changes. So I think from, let's say, the NGO community or something like this, it's really would be interesting to hear more about, you know, how do we really target individual level uh, behavior change to shift diets? And can I add to what Catherine sure. just said? For, for me, the, the important aspect is also that we don't necessarily need to focus on behavioral change only and look at the structural changes. And just coming back to the take home messages from the Global Lancet Countdown in 2022 report that just came out, where they highlight our fossil fuel addiction or the fossil fuel subsidies that sustain a system that's ultimately unsustainable and yet the financial uh, um, benefits that the fossil fuel industry gets from uh, the status quo is just unconscionable. The fact that we subsidize it with billions of euros and dollars is just not sustainable in the long run. And um, not to focus on the behavioral um, issues only, but also taking a structural approach and see how we need to set policies to eliminate fossil fuel <laughs> addiction um, subsidies that 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 drive um, um, the health of, of the planet into the ground is just not not an option for the future. So we need to take a structural approach with policies and intervene on a policy level. 
Thank you so much. I fear time is running out a little bit. Thank you so much also for, for highlighting co-benefits and co-benefit policy making, I think is what, what is needed in the future. Um, maybe you have time to quickly answer the questions in the Q&A that haven't been here now in the, in the panel discussion, because I think the audience is very interested in your answers to read them. And thank you so much for this very insightful presentation and discussion of, of your results. And I very much look for, uh, forward to really dive into myself, into the report again, um, and look at all the other indicators that you haven't presented um, today, but are in the, in the report. Maria, I give back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maike. This was really, really good to listen to. And uh, now after the panel, we have uh, two more presentations before our closing remarks. And I would like to invite Rana Orman Peace, and uh, you're a Climate and Health Fellow of the Association of Schools of Public Health in the European region. And we invite you to speak about the 2022 EU policy brief of the Lancet Countdown. Please feel welcome, Rana. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you all for coming. And I'm honored to have led the policy brief for Europe this year. Uh, this has been a joint effort by the Lens Countdown, the Lens Countdown in Europe, CPME, IFA, HEAL, and ASFA. And especially in a crisis as big as the climate crisis, uh, it's important to bring our strengths together. Uh, floods, droughts, heat waves, wildfires, these illustrate the impacts of extreme weather and climate events on health in Europe. Reducing emissions and adapting to impacts of climate change are crucial to ensure the health of people, but also of the planet. As one of the major contributors to the climate crisis, uh, Europe has a global responsibility to move towards a low carbon economy. We recognize the climate goals set by the EU, such as the EU climate law, uh, which has been endorsed by the European Parliament uh, recently, and which forms a binding obligation to realize the EU's climate ambition. Although there are many uh, European policies and initiatives, it is evident that more and adequate action is needed to secure our health and future. In this year's policy brief, we focus on three of the key areas identified in the Lens Countdown Global and European reports. These are sustainable food and diets, ambient air pollution, and greening the healthcare sector. Regarding sustainable food and diets, the European Lens Countdown report shows that the total demand uh, for food was responsible for about one third of Europe's emissions. Meat, dairy, and eggs make up the majority of per capita emissions. And it's evident that we need a shift towards healthier, plant-rich and affordable diets by reducing the intake of red meat and dairy products. We also need to steer away from animal products to reduce the probability of developing zoonosis, such as COVID-19. We therefore recommend developing national food strategies that support the transformation of food production, manufacturing, retail, service and distribution systems. We recommend uh, special attention to uh, restricting marketing and advertising of unhealthy food with a large carbon footprint. In our brief, we also focus on ambient air pollution. Exposure to uh, fine particulate matter, also known as PM 2.5, uh, leads to a range of serious health impacts. This includes increased risk of respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, lung cancer and premature death. The Lancet countdown data showed that in 2020, approximately 117,000 deaths in Europe were attributable to exposure to PM 2.5 from the combustion of fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and gas. And I just heard uh, about the fossil fuel addiction, I see that too. We recommend that the EU air quality standards are fully aligned with the updated WHO global air quality guidelines by 2030 at the latest. And action is still needed across all European countries to further reduce air pollution, particularly from fossil fuel sources. Yet, unfortunately, some countries have indicated they will refer to coal uh, for energy supply as a result of the energy crisis um, exacerbated by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Lastly, we mentioned the healthcare sector in our policy brief. 
And the healthcare sector is a major contributor to global emissions with around 5% of the total emissions. Um, the largest source of the sector is linked to the supply chain. And reducing the healthcare sector is not only important as an effective response to climate change, but also is very evident that the sector that has a purpose of protecting human health uh, makes sure that it is. We recommend that national efforts to decarbonize healthcare services uh, towards net zero emissions should be increased. Among others, we recommend action in the areas of improving energy efficiency, regulating the procurement of pharmaceuticals and medical devices, uh, developing waste management systems, and investing in research and sustainability. And in parallel to reducing healthcare related emissions, Health promotion and disease prevention remains essential uh, to reduce population demand for healthcare by supporting better health for all. So in short, climate change threatens to reverse the progress made over the last 50 years in global health and development. And Europe has a major uh, and prominent role to play in this uh, crisis. We believe that taking up the recommendations in these key, uh, key areas will help fight that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rana, for that. Uh, it's really interesting to hear more about the briefs. And now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Alexandra Kashmirshek, and you coordinate the European Climate and Health Observatory at the European Environment Agency. And I know you have a particular interest in social inequalities in relation to exposure to climate change hazards, and also social uh, justice in adaptation responses. And I know also that you have a long experience in urban adaptation to climate change, also something that's been raised earlier in this launch. And you will give a presentation on towards better understanding of climate change impacts on health in Europe, the European Climate and Health Observatory. Please for, feel warmly invited. Many thanks, Maria, and uh, everything you said is absolutely correct. So many thanks for the for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, with you at the launch of the um, uh, European Lancet uh, Countdown report. Let me just uh, share my presentation. So uh, indeed, I would like to, in the next 10 minutes, talk about the European Climate and Health Observatory as one of the growing number of initiatives aimed at improving our understanding of both climate change impacts on human health and the solutions what could be done about addressing or preventing those impacts. So the observatory is an uh, initiative of the European Commission and the European Environment Agency with a number of uh, partners, including uh, other European agencies, WHO Europe, Copernicus, and of course, Lancet Countdown um, in Europe. The observatory is, um, is a partnership and a portal uh, collating information of relevance to the decision makers uh, that can do something about climate change impacts on, on health. And it was uh, launched uh, in March last year, indeed, uh, recognizing the need to better understand the, the impacts on, on human health. Uh, we recently published a uh, long-term vision for the observatory, which is guided by some strategic objectives, where we want to be in a few years' time. And I'm not asking you to read the small text on the screen, and just to highlight that uh, the first of the objectives is that the users should be able to monitor the health risks, the impacts, but also the progress towards adaptation through robust indicators. So here, the collaboration with Lancet Countdown in Europe really is invaluable for us uh, because you guys are developing the indicators that are so desperately needed and also that our um, uh, networks of uh, decision makers at the national and sub-national level sub-national level are indicating that are very important uh, to guide their actions in 21 and 22, we've been looking at two uh, main uh, topics, which are climate sensitive uh, infectious diseases and the threats coming from high temperatures to, to human health. Uh, so in the rest of the presentation, I will focus on these two. 
So uh, in terms of the um, high temperatures, we know that heat waves kill and they are likely to, to kill more people in the future if no adaptive actions are being taken. Uh, at the EEA, we are um, uh, using data of reinsurance companies on reported fatalities associated with uh, climate extremes, uh, which gives a bit of an indication how high a share of the fatalities associated with extreme weather events is actually caused by heat. But these data is, is likely to be um, underreported. And I think it's a an, it's an really big obstacle that we have no consistent reporting on heat related mortality across Europe, both for understanding the scale of the impacts, but also, and maybe more importantly, for understanding what effect the solutions we implement have. We know from the uh, colleagues at Copernicus Climate Change Service that the risk of uh, health-related heat waves, the, the heat waves that are both hot and humid is increasing. And whilst in the baseline scenario, there was no place in Europe with more than five uh, such days per year, in the near future, we can see uh, up to 20, 30, 40 days a year in Southern Europe. And at the end of the century, we can see up to 70 days a day with uh, really dangerous to human health conditions. So that really emphasizes the need to prepare for uh, these uh, scenarios associated with high temperatures. The Lancet uh, countdown in Europe indicators are, are talking about the exposure of uh, vulnerable uh, people through uh, the aging population in Europe, through urbanization for the prevalence of diseases, but we also see that the vulnerable people are exposed very locally. Uh, we've done some analysis at the EA looking at the um, uh, distribution of healthcare facilities and, and the educational facilities in European cities uh, against uh, urban heat modeling. And we see that nearly half of the urban hospitals across 100 European cities and four out of 10 schools are located within a strong urban heat island effect, which might exacerbate the, the exposure of the vulnerable users to, to heat. What we also see is that whilst on average, then European cities have around 42% of uh, uh, green infrastructure within the area, around schools and hospitals, this percentage is much lower. Around uh, healthcare facilities, we can see that only around 16% of the area is green. So that really calls for um, better implementation of the adaptation solutions, also such as um, urban greening. Whilst the uh, Lancet Cowden in Europe indicators are looking at the past trends, we complement it in the observatory for the projections for the future. And for example, how the clim climatic suitability for Edis albopictus, the vector of uh, dengue, uh, Zika and chikungunya viruses, how it's uh, likely to change in the future. And we see the progressive spread of the climatic suitability to the North and Western Europe with larger areas covered in the future and also calling for them uh, for action. And uh, as I mentioned, we also look at the actual uh, responses in, in policy and, and practice. Earlier this year, we looked at the national climate adaptation strategies and the national uh, health strategies across Europe to see to what extent they covered the different uh, climate change risks to health. And uh, one finding is that the national adaptation strategies seem to be recognize uh, more health uh, risks from climate change than the health strategies, which indicates that it's really uh, for the uh, health sector to pick up on the climate change topic and, uh, and do something about it. And we also see that there is a lot of emphasis on the uh, climate sensitive infectious diseases in those strategies and also on the heat. In terms of the responses planned, uh, the most frequently planned type of action is increasing the monitoring and surveillance and uh, the implementation of early warning systems. Uh, we also see a lot of emphasis on awareness raising campaigns, uh, more research, uh, improved governance structures that would allow to cut across the silos. 
but we see that a lot of these actions are still very preparatory in, in character. So it's really the, the need to, to, to start implementing very concrete and robust solutions across Europe to prevent further uh, life and uh, health losses from climate change. The observatory also includes some examples of self, such solutions implemented in practice. Uh, for example, uh, heat health uh, action plans, both at national and subnational level, examples of uh, adaptation of healthcare facilities to the changing climate, um, examples how uh, the vulnerable locations such as schools can be greened to provide the respite from heat, not just for, for, for the kids and, and teachers, but also for people from the community living around the school. Um, some vector control actions taken to, to prevent uh, the populations of uh, invasive uh, mosquitoes from, uh, from settling in, but also examples of more um, broader um, initiatives that are aiming at uh, engaging the uh, health sector uh, practitioners into becoming champions of uh, climate change topic as well as uh, initiatives uh, aimed as, for example, um, improving the, uh, the mental health uh, and easing the climate anxiety associated with the climate change. So um, a few um, messages that we see coming from our work to date is uh, to repeat what's been said before, there is really a need for very urgent mitigation and adaptation actions. We also see the need for awareness raising both above the, among the health sector professionals, uh, public health uh, professionals, but also the, the general public. We need to make the uh, healthcare systems resilient, not just to the direct impacts of climate change, such as heat waves or flooding, but also to the changed and potentially increasing demand during the heat waves or the demand for uh, proper a diagnosis of, uh, of uh, uh, for example, uh, food poisoning associated with uh, marine biotoxins as one of the emerging risks. There is also a need for a better recognition of vulnerable groups and really focus on socially just responses that would take care of the most vulnerable people in our society first, as well as the knowledge development and exchange on the effectiveness of solutions. So I hope that the observatory can, can be a, a, a vehicle for, uh, for, for, for some of those and especially for the, for the knowledge exchange. Um, and uh, just a little plug uh, from my side, we're just about to launch a new EEA report, which is partially drawing on the Lancet countdown in Europe um, indicators, but also supplementing it with uh, other information uh, from the observatory. So we are all uh, very warmly invited to a launch event uh, on the 9th uh, November, which will be happening through the EU health policy platform. So I hope to see you then. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for this uh, overview. And uh, before I, uh, before I, uh, we give some closing remarks, I would like to thank you all who have participated for joining this launch event, and thank you to all speakers and panelists. And finally, now I would like to invite Dr. Maria Neira to conclude and give some closing remarks. And Dr. Neira is since 2005, the director of the Department of Public Health and Environment at the World Health Organizations. And I also know you've worked for WHO since 1993. So I know you always have a lot to tell us. So please, Maria, we look forward to your closing remarks. Thank you so much. And it's really a pleasure to join you. There have been uh, two very exciting days with the launch of the Lancet uh, report. I think it has raised a lot of interest. Uh, we saw it on the media. We saw it in, uh, on television. We, we, we know that it has created a lot of debate uh, and interest. And uh, people is talking about not only the research and the academic community, but now there are uh, definitely a very interesting uh, uh, effort to do uh, awareness raising and uh, advocacy. We are all 
very happy, happy about that uh, first outcome. So thank you so much to the Lancet group, uh, Richard, Marina, and all the team. They have been doing an amazing work, uh, of course, Tony as well. And, um, and we are very happy as WHO to be one of the, the, the organizations uh, supporting very strongly the Lancet Countdown report. Obviously, uh, what has been, been presented today here has been very important as well. You have been giving us hope, giving us uh, the, 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 the treatment now of the patient. I think the Lancet countdown, together with many reports that we have been issuing for the last years, give us a clear diagnosis. We know that the climate change is a, is a, is a health crisis as well. We know that this is affecting our health in many ways. We have more and more evidence. That's a very clear diagnostic now. So what next? What do we do now? How, as a, a public global health community, what is our responsibility just to make that diagnosis? No way. Now we need to make sure that we will propose some actions, uh, very relevant ones, that will generate the, 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 the solutions that we need. And I think most of them are, are very important. As a global health community, we need to make sure that the funds for adaptation, for, for, for helping the countries to become more climate resilient are there. But more importantly is that we need to as well make sure that everybody understands very clearly the health benefits of uh, tackling the causes of climate change. What we need is to drive these three transitions that are so much needed. The transition to a green, renewable, healthy source of energy, the transition to sustainable food systems, and the transition to a healthy <laughs> urban planning. All of that will give us enormous benefits, will give us health outcomes, will give us hope, will give us common sense, all of them that will represent common sense investments after all. And this is why the, the, the global uh, health community needs to be very well aligned on describing all of those benefits, on, on making sure that everybody understands this sense of urgency, the sense of crisis, but at the same time as well, that the urgency to be very ambitious and then and, and with an incredible speed on accelerating this transition. Air pollution has been very strongly uh, mentioned and you know how much in WHO we are linking and making sure that uh, for us, uh, everybody understand that the same drivers that are causing uh, 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 global warming are the responsible for, for air pollution. And therefore most of the, the uh, actions to, to tackle the cost of climate change will result as well on a decrease on the, the, the pollution levels and an increase in the air quality. Those are incredibly powerful interventions. Yesterday, they, they, it was the approval, as you know, of the, uh, of the uh, new standards of the EU. And uh, well, we, we always need to keep very ambitious. There is never uh, uh, ambition enough, uh, big enough, when we are talking about public health. We need to go for the best, and because uh, more we are ambitious on that, more lives we are saving, more quality of life of people we are promoting. And in a few days, we will be working all in, uh, in, at COP27, so we need to make sure that our voice is, is, is there very strongly. The health community, we have very clear diagnostic, but we have as well a very clear treatment protocol and uh, uh, prescriptions on how to take care of our patients. So we are not just uh, uh, looking at the patient and saying he's in a bad state. We are proposing what are the next steps and the next steps are very easy. We need to uh, make uh, common sense investments and, and accelerate this transition to, to energies that are the sources of energy that will not kill us and cause all of this damage. We need to stop giving subsidies to the fossil fuels industry. That money can go to the, 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 the global health uh, community and uh, that will generate incredible results. And we need to, to help um, our policymakers and governments to take those uh, common sense, wise decisions that will be so important for the economy of the country. We are very conscious that this is a critical moment for the sustainable development of a country and for the protection of uh, our health. And all of that will be on the same package. 
with the same prescriptions, we will obtain all of that. The health of our patient, the, the, the good economy, more jobs, green jobs, uh, different ways of consumption and, 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 and better nutrition for all, better cities. Uh, we will decrease uh, non-communicable diseases. Name it. I mean, there will be only benefits, an incredible bro uh, broad spectrum of benefits if we take the right decisions and we put the money on the right investments. And for that, no excuses. We have the science, we have the tools, we have the evidence, we have the mobilized community. It's just a now, it takes political decision. And our role is to make sure that we will put all the pressure because, uh, for, to ensure that these political decisions will go in the right way. Thank you so much for this uh, exciting discussion and for this important report that will contribute. And thank you very much for being aligned, mobilized, and, and, and happy to, 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 to join this call for, for more action. And we are not just uh, contemplating our patient, we are taking care of it. Thank you so much, Marianne. And by this, I would like to repeat my really huge thank you to all who has joined this, uh, this launch event as participants, but also again to all speakers, to all panelists. So let us join forces and work together to make sure that we really get some good action on climate change and health mitigation and adaptation. So thank you for today. Bye.